Okay, so uh, this is uh, week 11 of uh, Psych uh, 3280, Neural Based Subconsciousness, and um, this week's topic is Consciousness and Integration. So first, a uh, recap of uh, week 10. There, I introduced uh, the theory of consciousness uh, called the Integrated Information Theory, or IIT, for consciousness. And the uh, uh, logic of this theory is, um, as the title of the uh, paper says, it is uh, from the phenomenology to the mechanism, and which is a different uh, kind of approach uh, from other types of the theories, such as uh, global uh, neural workspace uh, theory. And uh, what it tries to do is, uh, rather than tackling the hard problem of consciousness from uh, building up from what we know about brain and then to explain how the brain produces consciousness, rather, we first uh, try to identify the uh, properties of the phenomenology, conscious phenomenology, and then to deduce what kind of um, neural mechanisms can support such uh, properties. And uh, as depicted here, uh, the five uh, fundamental properties uh, IAT identifies is first intrinsic existence, that consciousness exists, and the composition, that is that in any uh, experience of uh, conscious contents is uh, composed of various uh, components. And then informativeness, uh, meaning that uh, any uh, moment of consciousness is informative in the sense that uh, it excludes all, uh, it's, it's one out of many possible conscious experience. And uh, integration uh, means that the conscious experience is always uh, experience as unified whole, uh, not split uh, by this um, split, split like you know kind of image. And also exclusion means that the consciousness uh, is experienced as a, a, at a particular scale with a boundary and no less, no more in terms of space and time as well as the features. And here's a uh, uh, schematic of the uh, IAT inspired uh, index called the uh, um, uh, Perturbational Complexity Index. So here, um, uh, what um, IAT predicted was that the, the level of consciousness uh, should be um, high when the brain is in a state of highly differentiated and also uh, integrated. And uh, now this PCI or TMS EEG methodology um, does is rather than to um, uh, gauge the contents of conscious or the level of consciousness in the patient uh, by um, uh, motor response or sensory input processing, um, directly stimulating the brain and then measure uh, its uh, property, you know, response property. And in the case of wakefulness or REM sleep or uh, locked in syndrome or minimally conscious states where multiple measures of consciousness indicates that you know, they are conscious, uh, there the evoked pattern of the neural activity uh, is quite complex. It uh, propagates across many areas and so it extends over time. However, under the non-REM sleep or anesthesia, general anesthesia or vegetative uh, state and wakeful syndrome, um, the evoked response by the TMS usually dies out really quickly or um, it um, generates a uniform ac activation which also dies out really quickly. And the per, uh, PCI quantifies this complexity of the uh, evoked response in some way and then it uh, uh, seems to be working as a sort of the most uh, promising uh, measure of uh, level of consciousness. And that's the, uh, what we learned, uh, what I explained uh, last week. All right, so in this week, uh, uh, we'll introduce how to compute the integrated information. And from the viewpoint of IIT, we will examine uh, the cases of outer states of consciousness, in particular spirit brain, but uh, also we recap a um, couple of cases as well. So the learning objectives of this week is uh, to answer the following questions. First, uh, how can we compute integrated information? And how can uh, we estimate the proposed boundary of consciousness? And I'm going to give, a, uh, again, non-mathematical uh, kind of explanation and uh, I will not examine this uh, in the uh, exam quiz in, the, in detail. But uh, the level of the detail that I explain in the slides is fine to uh, go on. Then the secondly, uh, uh, the second um, question is, uh, what are the reported phenomenology or behavior of spirit brain patients? 
um, them. How does IAT explain various known facts about consciousness, such as spirit brain patients? Uh, the first part of the lecture is about the uh, um, uh, recap of the IAT first. And um, uh, as I said in the last week, IAT is a theory of level and the boundary and the contents of consciousness. And you can think of it in this order. Um, the level of consciousness is um, the system level integrated information. And that's uh, approximated by the PCI, but it's, you know, uh, the real integrated information is not really like uh, that uh, kind of a number, PCI. And I'm going to try to explain this this week. And then mm -hmm. um, in terms of boundary of consciousness, it is, uh, I'll come back to this throughout this week, but it is a subset of the mechanisms uh, that maximizes a system level integrated information. Okay, if you don't understand it right now, it's fine. And then the contents of consciousness or qualia uh, is uh, the pattern of the integrated information among the all subsets of the mechanism within this boundary. And if this is going to be the topic next week. Uh, the final uh, lecture, Frontiers in Consciousness. All right, so the remaining questions from the last week was that the, now, you know, if you are convinced that, you know, PCI seems to be a good approach for the level of consciousness, uh, then uh, the next question is that, you know, how we can actually, you know, measure the real integrated information. And if it is a proxy, PCI is a proxy, then if we can develop the method to actually uh, compute integrated information, it could uh, even further, you know, um, uh, improve the measurement of consciousness and uh, get to the even um, communication with the non-speakable patients and so on. And then uh, uh, in the course of this uh, measure of integrated information, it's also important to estimate the boundary of consciousness, which of the within which you know within the system which part of the system is uh generating conscious experience or supporting this you know conscious experience that the system uh, is experiencing and the understanding these uh, uh is definitely necessary to understand iit's explanations of what we know about consciousness but also uh it's important to uh, make a prediction on consciousness into the future Okay, so then uh, how can we compute uh, um, integrated information? So to be exact, it is actually best to go into the original uh, paper and uh, the latest version of IAT 3.0, uh, which uses um, just a simple, you know, mechanism for the explanation but uh, it is already quite a long um, tutorial. And then if you go to this in tutorial video, you will see exactly how it's computed, at least for the very, very simple systems. But uh, this week, uh, I'm going to give a lecture based on this uh, previous version of IIT uh, called IIT 2.0, because this one has a uh, easier way to explain uh, the concepts to uh, the people. And uh, in particular, these uh, three papers will be most useful if you are interested in understanding it, but still uh, the two uh, initial papers are quite much heavy. My paper in Philosophy uh, Compass doesn't use much uh, math, so that may be the easiest way to get to that. All right, so the overall idea behind the uh, computation of this you know, quantity called the integrated information, you know, this quantity itself is nothing to do with consciousness. It's uh, similar to any kind of network property of uh, uh, whatever you, know, uh, you can find in uh, any uh, textbook, actually. So uh, first uh, procedure is to determine all possible states for a uh, subsystem uh, can be in. And here, for example, uh, if uh, last week uh, we considered a photodiode, which contain, uh, which has uh, two states, either on state or off state. And that's like, you know, these two possible states. And one neuron also, uh, we can consider it's either firing or not. But uh, if we start to distinguish different kind, mode of uh, firing or different, you know, uh, membrane potential, then um, there can be many more uh, states for our neuron. Okay. And then uh, next uh, uh, step is to determine how much of its uh, future or past states, these you know subsystems, uh, subsystem states are constrained or determined by its current state. 
And this is uh, what we call intrinsic information. How much of this uh, current state of the system knows or predicts about future past states. And that's all uh, it means that uh, it is intrinsically, you know, in, from the inside perspective, uh, how much it is know, uh, it knows about itself information. Okay. And for example, uh, if the system's behavior is completely random and the random, uh, randomness comes from just a pure mechanism uh, of this system. And uh, if the system doesn't have any access to this in randomness itself, then uh, it can't predict any future, future. And so it uh, doesn't know anything about its uh, past state. So that corresponds to no intrinsic information. And then uh, uh, next one is uh, quantifying how much information the subsystem loses when it is minimally cut. And this minimal cut is a very important kind of concept for the integrated information. And the amount of the loss is uh, integrated information. Okay. Let's start with this you know, most uh, simple, uh, simplistic you know, um, uh, system. So we now consider uh, this you know, hypothetical uh, neuron A and B, which copies its states to the other with a you know, different time step. And uh, this neuron system, uh, you can imagine that uh, it has only uh, two states per neuron. So it's either on or off. So A could be on or off, okay? And B could be also on or off. And then AB itself uh, could be on on or off on or on off or off off. There are only four possible states in this system. Now uh, we consider a simple example of this situation. Let's say when the current situation of this system, the current state of the system is on off, neuron A is on and B is off. Then the next time step, because of this you know, copy copy rule, A's state becomes on or uh, off, and then uh, B's state becomes on. Okay, so this is on, and then this becomes on, and then this is B state, A state. And then uh, off state B is copied to A, okay? And the important thing here is that the system AB, a future state is completely determined by the current state. There is no ambiguity. And there was a previously possibly four uh, states, but now it's determined into one state. Uh, if you know the information theory, it's uh, corresponding to the reduction of the uncertainty. So the next is that uh, you can do the same thing for the past. Now, if the current state is on off, then uh, it must be the case that the neuron A and B was off on this uh, situation because of this you know, copy state, a copy mechanism. So now, by now you can kind of already uh, understand that uh, the state of the system a, B, or anything else is determined by the mechanistic states of each individual, uh, you know, things. And how it transits from one state to the another is uh, determined by how the rule of this you know, connection is. And uh, in the case of the brain, uh, it's likely to be probabilistic. So it's not like, you know, deterministic like this. And then also, um, the copy is not like uh, the first, you know, um, most you know, unique or most sort of the probable kind of mechanism in the brain. It's more to do with, you know, um, just adding the output from A to B and then B receives uh, many other neurons, roughly like thousand to 10,000 neurons. And then when B uh, collects all these uh, uh, input at over a certain period, and if it exceeds uh, some threshold, B fires. So uh, it's more like, you know, some and then threshold type uh, uh, rule, but I'll just, you know, uh, simplify everything here. And uh, it means uh, uh, basically uh, you can identify or define these, you know, past state and pre uh, uh, future state based on the current uh, state of the system. Okay, this is just a, a simple kind of definition. And then now, uh, how much intrinsic information does AB jointly together have? 
so to address this uh, question, um, what IIT proposed is that first um, determine all possible states what system can be in, and then in our case, our simple uh, example case, it's a four states, and then determine how much its uh, future or past state is uh, constrained determined by its current state. And then in our case, it was uh, completely determined. So it's a two bits. Um, uh, if you know this, you know, the terminology bits, then um, that corresponds to, uh, you know, two units. The uh, state is completely determined by each. So one bit plus one bit, and that's two bit. And that corresponds to log logarithm of the two states over four states. You know, uh, four state is now reduced into one state. That's the information terminology, okay? But you don't need to understand this part. Now, what happens uh, if we cut uh, the system in the you know, connection between A and B? And uh, cutting operation in IIT uh, can be considered as uh, replacing that wire with a noisy connection, okay? So if, what, what happens if A, B, and B is, no, instead of copying it to each other, are uh, replaced by the noisy source of the wire. Previously, the states of the system remains for on, on, off, on, on, off, off, off. So that doesn't change. What changes is this uh, predictability to the future and uh, uh, knowing about the past. Because of this noise, A tries to copy into B, but it's corrupted. And uh, B's state off is also trying to be copied to A, but it's again corrupted by the noise. And uh, by noise, we define that, you know, uh, both on and off happens 50% uh, of the time. Then we just can, uh, you know, predict its state at all, A and B at all, okay? And then that's the same for uh, the case for uh, the past state. Even if uh, the system is in an on-off state right now, it could have been that an off-off or on-on or off-on or on-off state that gets you know, corrupted by the noise and then come to the current state. So we have no, I mean, system AB has no knowledge about you know, future or past of its state. It doesn't have any intrinsic information about itself if the connection is uh, replaced by the noise, okay? So uh, this uh, corresponds to um, the um, step of the quantifying how much information it loses when the subsystem is minimally cut. And this is defined as an integrated information, okay? So uh, just in terms of the equation, like uh, conceptual equation, like in you know, a format, integrated information value, phi, sometimes called phi, is defined as original intrinsic information, how much it knows or constrains future and the past, minus intrinsic information after the cuts. And in this case, we knew about its uh, you know, future and the past two bits, but after the cut, we don't know anything about future or past and about zero bits. And subtraction of two minus zero corresponds to two bits, two bits of integrated information in this system. And then uh, I haven't actually discussed about what is a minimal cut up to now, and this is very important uh, uh, concept and many people don't understand this uh, in the uh, people who criticize IIT, but you know, I'll just try to go through it. So the key idea here is that to estimate how much a system is integrated, we need to find uh, one way to actually, one way to find the weakest uh, 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 to you know, uh, estimate uh, how much a system is integrated, uh, IIT basically proposes to find the weakest link of that system and then cut there to identify the integratedness, okay? So for example, our, you know, uh, example that we used last week, this kind of, you know, complicated, you know, system which has a you know, strong or weak connections and many of the um, systems are have a bi-directional or unidirectional kind of connection. There, you know, no matter how you try to um, cut the system, Let's say, you know, you want to cut only this one or this one, or maybe you want to cut right here. We lose a lot because, you know, the state of the next system state based on the current state of the system is um, influenced and also, you know, um, informed by all these, you know, uh, connections, you know. So if we replace 
some of these you know, uh, connections by the noise, it will reduce how much the system knows about itself, no matter what you know, kind of this you know, connection. And the, this is a kind of situation where uh, the system is highly integrated. But uh, we need to identify which one is the weakest link to really compute this integrated information of this system. And that's very different from you know, PCI kind of idea, okay? On the other hand, this kind of system, uh, um, which we also you know, uh, propose that the PCI should be very low, here it's really easy to find out you know, um, what's the minimum count, right? Um, so if we cut the system at, let's say this in a horizontal uh, line, then there's absolutely nothing we lose about you know, itself's future or its, itself's uh, past because you know, there is no connection to begin with. So, you know, uh, we don't even need to replace it with a random noise, uh, you know, connection. And this is a case of the low or zero integration system. However, to conclude this, we need to actually cut carefully or, you know, I, after identifying the weakest link first. For example, if we cut the system in this in diagonal line, then, and they replace all these, you know, uh, cut system with a noise um, thing, then we do lose some of the in intrinsic information. And this is a reason why we need to uh, find the minimum count. And uh, uh, this system's integrated information is always evaluated at the minimum count or weakest link. And then um, we move on to uh, come back to this uh, case of the cerebellum. Um, uh, in the week three uh, lecture, if you remember, I introduced this, you know, a patient who was born without cerebellum, and this is a sagittal uh, view, and this is a coronal view. And uh, this person uh, had some difficulty in the, you know, in the beginning of the life in terms of movement or language, but you know, by the time uh, she became adult, she was very intelligent, and uh, there was no problem, and uh, um, so on. And then a clinical evaluation of uh, this person uh, ended up in uh, this statement, uh, evaluation of the sensory system showed no abnormalities. And she was just you know, um, uh, hospitalized for completely different reasons other than her consciousness. And then there she discovered that cerebellum was missing. But at the same time, I also uh, emphasized that um, cerebellum as a, you know, although the small in terms of volume, it contains four times more neurons than the cerebral cortex. So it's very uh, puzzling why this is the case. And I didn't really, uh, give any kind of explanation why it is the case. But now knowing IAT, we can uh, at least give a, a, a principled explanation. So what IAT proposes as an explanation of this uh, no loss of consciousness due to the uh, damage in the cerebellum is that um, Basically, cerebellum uh, architecture, if you look at uh, the neuroanatomy and also physiological studies, then they are more or less like, you know, uh, uh, operating in a locally parallel circuit, okay? And then also it is a feed forward mostly. And feed forward receiving the input from prefrontal cortex and basal ganglia and then to uh, cerebellum and then feed back into these you know, areas again. So it's a kind of loop, but you know, feed forward loop. And that uh, controls very careful timing and so on, which is very important for language control or motor control. And uh, if you apply IAT kind of idea, then what happens is that then these you know, hugely packed and also you know, densely packed, uh, very large number of the neurons, they are uh, mostly uh, you know, configured like this way. And each of the module may contain some a bit of the you know, phi. So maybe, you know, we need to define, you know, minimum cut here or something like that. But if you consider only this module, then the phi value is possibly 20. But if you consider all of this, all of this, you know, uh, um, uh, cerebral uh, circuits, then obviously there is a uh, weak link here. And there it doesn't, you know, you don't lose much because each of them is doing all, all its own thing. So if you cut the cerebellum here, you know, the result of this computation doesn't get affected. 
And this results in a prediction that, you know, cerebellum as a whole, this is a picture, anatomical picture of the cerebellum, as a whole should uh, generate really minimum uh, integrated information. And therefore, uh, it doesn't generate or it doesn't, it, it has minimum, uh, you know, influence uh, in consciousness, roughly speaking. So summary so far is uh, that, first of all, phenomenological observation uh, wise, I said that the IIT starts that um, our conscious experience is highly intrinsically uh, informative. Each moment of experience is highly distinct and differentiated. Okay, and then to uh, support this type of the uh, phenomenological observation, IIT proposes that um, this uh, intrinsic uh, informativeness has to be supported by some kind of uh, mechanism. That uh, the mechanism has to be intrinsically informative, and that corresponds to this, you know, having lots of you know states and also having some kind of knowledge about its future and also past. That's the intrinsically informative system. Okay, so that's the reason why. We don't uh, uh, predict that the photodiode is uh, not really unlikely to be, you know, conscious uh, because it doesn't uh, have much repertoire for the future or you know uh, past. And then uh, the uh, exact algorithm of the IAT is uh, to quantify how much the system contain uh, constraint its uh, uh, past or future. Second. Um, Phenomenological observation wise, our conscious experience is always integrated and experienced as a unified whole. And that's the sort of second uh, or you know, third uh, actions of IAT. And then IAT's proposal is uh, that to support this nature of this conscious experience, then the physical system that um, generates conscious experience has to be integrated in some way. And then to quantify the integratedness, the IIT then uh, suggests that we can quantify this by uh, quantifying loss of its intrinsic information by the cut. And the cut at the minimal cut, weakest link. That's the um, integrated information. All right, then um, what I um, finally uh, uh, explained was that the clinical observation of this uh, cerebellum patients. So they, Cerebellum uh, uh, contains uh, four times more neurons than the cerebral cortex, but uh, and uh, performs highly sophisticated computation like you know motor control, or language, you know, a production, and so on. However, it, uh, we do not seem to lose consciousness when it's lost, and it's not only because uh, of the um, birth uh, defects, but also if you have a cancer in the cerebellum, and sometimes you know uh, you need to take it out, but even if you take it out, you do not die or you do not uh, lose consciousness if it's done properly. And the reason uh, that IIT explains is that the cerebellum does not generate uh, integrated information, if anything much. And therefore, um, it's irrelevant for uh, consciousness and therefore we can cut that or you know, uh, it doesn't affect uh, experience. So now the next question is that what is the IAT's proposal about the boundary and the contents of consciousness? And the contents of consciousness next week and the next uh, part of the video is about the boundary. Okay, so uh, what is the boundary of consciousness? Uh, proposal from IAT. Um, as I said in the beginning of this lecture, uh, the boundary in IAT is uh, proposed as a subset of the mechanism that maximizes uh, system level integrated information. So what it means? Um, the subset that maximizes uh, integrated information uh, is uh, called a uh, complex in IIT terminology. And uh, what it means is that most integrated local subsystems uh, that attains the maximum of the integrated information. As an example, let's consider this system A, B, C, D. Okay, uh, this arrow indicates that uh, uh, you can consider it as uh, something like the last uh, example where A is uh, copying the state into B as well as C, and C copies uh, the, its state to A, and then B uh, copies it to A. But uh, D, uh, this one, 
is uh, um, putting some input into C. And D itself, uh, the state is kind of generated random. That's the kind of situation. And you can imagine that, you know, D is like an, um, um, a sensory uh, uh, apparatus, like an eye, and then it uh, sends on the feed forward input to C, and then C to A communicates, and A to B communicates. That's a kind of a uh, uh, situation, okay? And then where is the uh, core or complex of this system? To find it out, what IIT uh, propose is to try out all the possible uh, connections. And in this case, uh, uh, to, to be exact in terms of mathematics, uh, what we need to do is to try out this uh, Four, uh, four components into one verse of three. And the uh, number of these cuts is called four, one, four choose one. It's a uh, four possibility, only A out, only C out, only D out, only B out, okay? And then another types of the cut is uh, choosing uh, two at a time. And the easy way to think about it is how the A is grouped with another one. A with C, A, is a with D, A with B. So the, these are the three only possible ways to compute this, you know, um, um, test this co um, connection. Formally, it's a 4C2 divided by two because we uh, count AC and BD twice. And uh, that's uh, uh, three, okay? And then there are no other cuts in this particular system. And then um, you can imagine that you know, how much uh, we lose uh, in each of the system. In the case of this, you know, uh, two, uh, two, two, uh, you know, uh, cuts. We have uh, lots of cuts here, 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 and then here, 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 and this is a bidirectional cut. So, in each cases, it's a very um, heavy kind of cut that loses uh, information of uh, uh, states of. Um, the system AC itself or BD itself, you know, into the future or past. On the other hand, one of these uh, one to three cuts, which is this one, D cuts, here, uh, the state of the C, if, you, if we cut this, you know, input from D to C, is less determined because we don't know the, uh, you know, two of the, uh, um, reasons or sort of the mechanism that, you know, informs C's current status from the past, which is A and then D. And because the, now that these connection here becomes random, C's, uh, uh, you know, um, future state will be less known, okay? However, other types of the cuts, especially this, you know, bi-directional A to C and A to B is intact. And uh, um, this state is also not determined by anything from ABC. So this, you know, that intrinsic information about D itself is retained. And uh, if you go through the math that I, um, you know, proposed, it turns out that this one is uh, the best way to cut the system. I mean, uh, it leaks, it, uh, you know, uh, loses uh, least amount of the information. And that's called uh, minimum information partition. And then this one, bottom left. And that means that the, the, the complex of this system or the largest uh, local minimum of this system is this ABC. And IAT proposes that, you know, ABC is, if anything, uh, conscious. And uh, ABC's contents of consciousness is defined by how A contributes to ABC, B contributes to ABC, C contributes to ABC, as well as uh, all the possible combination, AB, AC, and CB contribute to ABC. And finally, ABC contributes to ABC. But that's something that I will explain next week. So no, no, I, I won't ask in the quiz this week. So uh, that's the, uh, you know, winning um, uh, weakest link cuts. And then now, uh, so uh, how IAT explains uh, one consciousness arising from two hemispheres. So as I explained in the area kind of, you know, uh, lecture, 
uh, brain is uh, composed of the left and the right hemisphere. And you have heard of this kind of stuff with uh, popular media or you know any neuroscientific or sci psychology textbook. And usually they are connected through the connections called uh, corpusculosum. And IAT proposes that um, the one consciousness arises from two conscious uh, com uh, uh, hemispheres because these uh, two hemispheres are connected in a certain way that uh, even though if we if it turns out that you know optimum connection uh, this connection is between the left and the right hemisphere we lose a lot and um, the in fact you know you can't really uh, cut in many ways and um, uh, eventually it's likely that you know this one thing out of this you know uh, entire brain is likely to remain as a local minimum and that corresponds to the uh, system that generates all our conscious experience. Okay, that's the IAT's explanation of one consciousness from two hemispheres. On the other hand, this also means that uh, there can be a situation where two consciousness can arise out of the um, two hemispheres. And in fact, this is a proposed uh, kind of you know, situation for the split brain. If we cut, the uh, all the connections between the left and right hemispheres then the local maximum of this um, um, complex will uh, start to emerge uh, independently between left and right each but if you try to com you know um, um, consider this splitted version of the left and the right hemisphere then because there is no physical connection between the left and the right to begin with there, if we cut it, it becomes zero. So here, um, uh, the connected version of this system, then we can probably find a MIP, uh, minimum information partition here, which gives us the phi equals zero, integrated information zero. And that's the reason why it is uh, um, considered as you know, uh, irrelevant. Instead, the subset, of this you know, bigger boundary, which is left hemisphere only or right hemisphere only, that generates its own conscious experience. And notice that um, the left side, um, the intact situation, the integrated information value is slightly bigger, but it's not that too small, 61 here. And exactly how many, uh, how much in integrated information uh, in the human brain, that's completely unknown. And uh, it's a uh, uh, research question that is um, unlikely to be addressed uh, in the near future. Future, but uh, there can be some kind of you know way to approximate or estimate uh, how much this can be uh, in the future research, and that's something that you know our uh, lab is working on. So uh, this is one of the figures from uh, Christoph Koch's um, uh, Quest for Consciousness in Chapter Seventeen, uh, which is a reading material this week. Um, so, the, as this caption uh, uh, explains, corpus callosum is a major um, pathway between the left and right, uh, major connection between the left and the right hemisphere. And um, it's, uh, contain, uh, it contains 200 million axons and together with much smaller anterior commissure that is uh, located in the, here, you know. And uh, uh, connects the uh, two cerebral hemispheres. Sensory or symbolic information is related from one side to the other in a complete split brain procedure. Both fibers are cut, both, you know, are uh, corpus callosum, and the anterior commissures are cut. And the anterior commissure is kind of interesting uh, for the Austrian people uh, in particular because um, uh, marsupia ma ma marsupials uh, like. Um, you know, kangaroo and koala and so on, they don't have a corpus callosum, but they have only, you know, gigantic anterior commissure. And uh, we don't know whether their consciousness is split or not, but uh, uh, yeah, corpus callosum is uh, evolutionarily, um, you know, a um, uh, new thing or not the kind of a structure that is preserved across all the animals. Okay, so this is the, um, the other way of um, uh, depicting the copper skeleton. If you split the brain like, you know, left and right like this, then you should be able to see the bundles, you know, fictitiously um, between uh, these, uh, through this, uh, you know, structure.
And uh, in the uh, actual split brain uh, operation, uh, uh, neurosurgeon cuts these, you know, uh, connections, and mainly the, uh, because of um, to, to trying to reduce the epilepsy that is caused by too much communication between the left and the right hemisphere. So uh, this is a, a, a famous kind of, you know, a spirit brain uh, experiment and uh, associated uh, uh, visual systems architecture. And uh, I'm going to probably ask this uh, in the uh, quiz. So uh, in the control participants case, when you are looking at this you know, black dot um, by eye fixating here, then uh, as I explained in a previous le uh, uh, lecture, right side of this you know, fixation gets projected to the left side and the left side of our eye retina on both sides, and then projects to left visual cortex, okay? And then our left side of the visual field uh, goes to uh, right side of the visual cortex. And then uh, if, what, what happens if this uh, person is blocked in the right eye? Left side, uh, left eye can still, while looking at this in a fixation point, can still see the key, and then that goes to right hemisphere. And then through this, you know, corpus callosum connections, okay, that uh, information can go to the other, the, uh, you know, usually homologous areas, and then goes to uh, other areas uh, within this, you know, um, left hemisphere. And many of the people usually have a, a capacity to generate language on the left hemisphere. So in this case, uh, most likely this uh, person can say that, oh yes, I saw a key. Mm -hmm. And that's how it goes with the control participant. Now, in the case of the split brain patient, uh, assuming that you know we don't have uh, this patient has, doesn't have an op uh, anterior uh, commissure as well, then what happens is that uh, when uh, this is covered by the right eye, then uh, left eye receives uh, this key information to the right hemisphere, but it's not going to cross. And then uh, on the other hand, uh, if it's presented to the right side of uh, the visual hemisphere, again, looked through the left eye, but then this side uh, gets connected and also you know, uh, goes to the uh, language side of the brain, which is this, uh, uh, which result in this, you know, I don't know response versus key response here. And that's a standard explanation of the spirit brain patient. So this is a cartoon uh, view of the phenomenology and the behaviors of uh, spirit brain patients. Um, the B, uh, the top left basically say that, um, you know, when this uh, person uh, examines this spirit brain patient and then uh, show a direction, uh, by the way, this person is looking at this, you know, small dots in both cases. And then the left side of the visual frame field, uh, information goes to her right hemisphere and the right hemisphere doesn't transfer the information to the left uh, hand field. And so he, she just, you know, says, uh, she, she just laughs, ha ha ha, because it says laugh, that's a command. And then this uh, uh, doctor asks, why are you laughing? And then uh, she says, what a way to make a living doing this kind of testing every day. Basically, uh, uh, she's giving an explanation to this doctor that, you know, she's laughing spontaneously, not because of the uh, direction here on the display. And the same goes in this, you know, uh, walk situation. If she is tested like this, then uh, she just, you know, spontaneously moves out from the uh, room. And then uh, when the doctor asks, where are we going? Are you going? Then, oh, I wanted uh, soda. But again, she uh, doesn't uh, say that, you know, she does that because uh, she was asked to do that with this, you know, kind of, you know, uh, direction. And in both of the cases, I think the original experiment was done in a way that, you know, uh, this doctor ensures the split brain person was looking at the center and then this uh, uh, letters and texts are um, carefully presented, uh, but, you know, briefly presented so they don't see uh, the uh, letter 
uh, except for the left visual field. But it's not uh, super clear exactly how this kind of experiment was done before, which uh, poses some problem, as I say later. Okay, so this is a kind of the um, quick sort of a, uh, quiz preparation, but what's happening here? So, you know, you should be able to fill in, but uh, our word presented to uh, left or right hemifield is sent to uh, right or left side of the brain. And then uh, here, because you know it's uh, presented to the left visual field, it's sent to the right side of the brain. The patient's uh, left, uh, the patient's right side of the brain controls, uh, you know, behaviors across, you know, like you know, uh, moving or uh, uh, laughter and so on. Uh, but both sides can uh, control this, you know, uh, body. And the patient's left side of the brain can control language. Okay. And then in this particular patient, um, communication, and in this particular patient, uh, communication between the uh, left and right hemisphere is, uh, the hemisphere are impaired. And therefore, uh, left side of the uh, brain comes up with an excuse and then um, gives a uh, excuse of why uh, she laughed or why she um, you know, walked away from the room, okay? So that's a kind of the um, uh, explanation uh, for uh, involved in this uh, split brain patient, traditionally. However, this may not be actually true. And this has been questioned by uh, Pinto et al. Uh, recently. And this uh, recent experiment was um, done uh, in a very careful, uh, carefully controlled manner. And this Pinto is the guy who I know quite well. And um, he's a... Uh, very careful psychologist. And when she, when he basically did, redid this experiment by two patients, uh, controlling eye movements and the duration of the stimulus and many things, then what he uh, concluded is the following three things. First, um, he was able to replicate the traditional finding where uh, when Traditional is a uh, upper, and the current finding is a uh, lower. According to the current finding is a Pinto et al's uh, paper. When uh, patients were asked whether any kind of you know simple shape like you know uh, circle and square are they same or not, then um, patients say that you know oh I don't know, and they using the right hand or left hand doesn't matter. They just can't do it at chance performance. And then uh, he basically replicated the same thing, but. If the object is presented on the only on one side of the uh, view, then in terms of presence or absence, unlike previous you know traditional view, which says that uh, because it's right hand field, it gets to the uh, you know uh, right hand field, and then right hand field cannot control the language, and so he, he says uh, no because I. You know, basically, the brain the, that controls the language is seeing any, nothing here. Okay, right hand field goes to the left uh, side of the brain, and the, that one controls this language response, which says no. And then, using right hand uh, is also controlled by the left hemisphere, so he um, would also report no using the right hand. On the other hand, uh, the left side of the uh, visual uh, input is controlled by the right hand field. So um, that leads to the report of the, yes, I saw something with the left hand. But what Yara Pinto found was that uh, regardless of the report modality, left hand, verbal report, or right hand, these patients say, yes, I saw something. Okay. And then the other uh, cases where it's, uh, when they presented uh, the right side of the M field, then not only the barbar and the right hand uh, response, which is controlled by the left hand field, hemisphere, but also left hand, which is controlled by right hand field, seems to say, yes, I saw it. So there is something going on which we don't really understand yet. But uh, that's the kind of the, uh, uh, one of the frontiers of consciousness research. And, you know, uh, as I emphasized uh, in the beginning of this, uh, really beginning of the lecture series that 
many things of uh, what we learn, um, what you learned in this course is actually a uh, potentially challenged and revised over the um, uh, next few years. And this is one of the uh, quite striking example of uh, revision of potential revision of all these uh, split brain finding. And we still don't know why this is actually possible, you know, why they can't do the same, same different judgment at all, but they can reliably see things on the right side only or left side only when the object, object is only one and can be reported by any modality. We still don't know. Okay. So now um, I want to also show uh, some of the phenomenology uh, or behaviors of the uh, split brain patient, which is quite striking. They describe in a correct manner. A similar visual stimuli are flashed into the left visual field, which go to the right hemisphere, such as a uh, fork like you see here. The patient will say uh, when asked, uh, uh, we will, the experiment will ask, what did you see? And the, and the patient will say, I didn't see anything. And the experimental, the experimental will then say, well, uh, pick out the card that best describes what you may have seen. And sure enough, the patient uh, goes out very calmly and points to the word fork. So that uh, what happens in the split brain patient is that all the sensory information that is projected and, and, and arrives in the left hemisphere can be talked about. But all that information that arrives in the right hemisphere is, is perceived and acted upon, but it is not talked about because the patient has no awareness of it in terms of verbally, audibly express it out loud. If speech originates in the left half of the brain, are there any functions special to the other half? Here, a split brain subject provides the answer. Speech originates in the left because the patient has no be talked about the word fork. So that uh, what happens in the split brain patient is that all the sensory information that is projected and, and, and arrives in the left hemisphere can be talked about. But all that information that arrives in the right hemisphere is, is perceived and acted upon, but it is not talked about because the patient has no awareness of it in terms of his ability to verbally, audibly express it out loud. If speech originates in the left half of the brain, are there any functions special to the other half? Here, a split brain subject provides the answer. As he tries to copy this pattern with blocks, we discover his ability is confined to his right half brain. Now let's remember that the left hand is governed from the right hemisphere. And you will see that he has absolutely no problem in solving the problem. When the patient tries to solve the problem with his right hand, which is governed from the left hemisphere, we find that he is not capable of doing it. Namely, that the right hand, which is governed from the left hemisphere, is intrinsically incapable of performing this kind of visual constructional tasks. It's interesting to note that the whole perspective is gone. He has three and one block combinations. It doesn't even square them up. You can see the left hand wants to keep helping the right and, and, and is interfering. Well, we're now seeing that the left hand can perform the problem and that the right hand cannot. Now the question becomes, what happens when you allow both hands together to try to solve the problem? And what we find out is that they fight over each other. One hand knows how to do it, and one hand does not. And so they more or less squabble. And the reason for this is that the, the hemispheres are disconnected. The right hemisphere controls the left hand, and the left hemisphere controls the right hand. And these are almost mutually independent systems. It was as if two people were fighting over performing this task. One knew how, and one didn't. And one would fight for dominance of the situation. So uh, the, well, what, what this uh, you know, YouTube video of the split brain patient um, shows is that uh, it's very likely that the, the right hemisphere is, uh, of this patient was probably highly um, intelligent and also um, purposeful and for all purpose and also you know, um, intents and uh, purposes it is probably pros uh, possessing uh, consciousness. And uh, as you can, uh, as you were able to see, you know, when the right hand, which is controlled by the left hemisphere, was trying to do this, you know, block um, task, they cannot, uh, that one just cannot do it, right? You know, which is quite interesting because, you know, if you are right-hander or left-hander, uh, normally, you know, without um, any split brain operation, you can do this type of the block operation with the right hand or left hand, you know, uh, normally. 
uh, almost at the uh, same performance. But after the split brain operation, this uh, kind of thing is uh, repeatedly shown. This is a very reliable thing, unlike you know, Pinto's challenge. Right, uh, right hand just cannot do this block, um, uh, you know, operation. However, with the left hand, it's super easy, and then um, this uh, patient can do it really quickly. And uh, it seems right the hemisphere knows about this fact because, you know, uh, unless this left hand was uh, prohibited to participate, it tries to help the right hand, and then that was kind of punished. So it's almost like, you know, a quarrel or fights going on between the one side of the uh, uh, one, one body and one sort of a skull, but fighting these things are between the two persons. And that's um, the sort of the traditional kind of interpretation of two minds, two consciousness within one body. All right. So now um, I want to also um, discuss or sort of the uh, show this uh, striking example of uh, the case, which was a relatively recently um, uh, reported, and it's been almost like maybe ten years or so. Uh, but uh, there was a, a very rare situation where two brains uh, are connected, um, uh, so-called conjoint uh, twins. You can follow this uh, web uh, website uh, to watch the entire episode, which is very interesting. But we'll see only excerpts of um, excerpts of this video. In a scenic corner of British Columbia, Canada, in an unexceptional suburban park, I meet two extraordinary little girls. High fives! Yay! Tatiana and Krista are conjoined twins, a most unlikely result of life's genetic lottery. <laughs> like any five-year-olds, they've got energy and curiosity to burn, but they've also got the scientific world enthralled by their incredible brains. It's like it's almost like being a hybrid. <laughs> a hybrid? <laughs> they're, they're hybrid, pretty much. Like, they can do things that nobody else can do. Talk about teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> it's the definition of it, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, definitely. When you first see Tatiana and Krista, it's hard not to be confronted by how they look. And given the risks and challenges that face all conjoined twins, you can understand any parents deciding to not proceed with the pregnancy. But Felicia Hogan never had any doubts. Shopping. Each twin is very much her own person. Who's been the bossy one now? You are, aren't you? Krista in the blue dress is bolshy. Tatiana in pink is more gentle. Different personalities, but with an incredible mental connection. You good? You good? You sure? Two separate brains that can behave as one. They can sit there and not say anything to each other and all of a sudden one will pop up and grab something to eat for the other one. Like there's no words being spoken between the two of them at all and they know exactly what the other one wants. Tickle one. Yeah, and the other one laughs. <laughs> yeah, you can pinch one and the other one will cry with her. She's like she's feeling it. From the first prenatal scan it was clear that the Hogan twins were unique. Here, you can see each of their two heads, in medical terms, known as craniopagus cojoined twins. What are the chances? Just one in two and a half million. Raising Krista and Tatiana isn't easy, and the entire extended family share the load. Big hug! Oh. Louise McKay is the girl's grandmother. She's more like a second mum. Thank you. They certainly haven't been wrapped in cotton wool, have they? No. <laughs> They've had to live and learn. Definitely not, no. We've, we've allowed them to be as normal as any two little girls can be. You're very proud of them, aren't you? Yep, I sure am. It's not medically possible to separate Tatiana and Krista. Each girl has her own organs, but their vascular system works as one. Their blood pumps through one girl and then through to the other. Tatiana's doing most of the pumping. Her metabolism works double time, which is why she's smaller, less robust. 
To look at, Tatiana physically seems the weak one. Yes. But she's the engine room. She's the engine room. <laughs> she's pumping all that oh, blood. Oh, yeah, she's... she's over to Krista. Yeah, she's doing all the hard work to keep them both going. How their bodies work together is remarkable. But it's how their brains work together that has really caught the imagination of medical researchers. Early tests, when they were still babies, revealed that their two brains are so connected they can even see for each other. They covered one baby's eyes completely and then they flashed a light in her eye and those signals were actually found on her sister's side as well as hers, which means she was seeing what her sister was seeing. Wow, four sets of eyes, yeah. two brains. Yeah. <laughs> Connection. So if I was to go, hi. How are you? To demonstrate, Mum Felicia covers Krista's eyes and places a stuffed toy in front of Tatiana. Despite her eyes being covered, Krista can still see the pig. Krista, what's Mummy holding? Uh, a, a piggy. That's right, Mummy's holding the piggy. Goodness me. So, um... The, the video uh, was recorded in 2012, and uh, uh, at that time, uh, the Tatiana and the Krista was uh, five years old. Uh, now uh, they must be uh, 13 years old. Uh, what's um, known afterwards is not so clear to me yet, but um, um, the, um, the situation seems just you know so you know exciting. And every time I watch this video, it's so you know uh overwhelming in many ways um the, so that uh let's see uh what we can uh think about this kind of situation from our uh, iit perspective so um as the video uh kind of implies that um, the two brains are mostly independent okay and then most likely the brain uh shares a little bit of um, some kind of connection between them at the level of salamas or brainstem. We, I, I'm not so sure exactly what's going on in their case yet. But one possibility of uh, this uh, situation, according to IIT, is that as long as uh, inputs or outputs are just shared, but uh, local maxima of the brain uh, is, in this case, it's not a separated two hemisphere, but uh, one hemisphere for uh, the two hemispheres for one consciousness and another two hemispheres for one other consciousness. And then sensation or thoughts possibly can be shared through uh, between them by uh, this you know, bridge kind of a connection. Feed forward the input uh, for uh, visual information may be easier to explain by sharing these you know, inputs. But a more interesting situation is that um, what they reported as uh, sharing or knowing what the others actually are tasting or what the others are feeling. So uh, one of the anecdotal evidence suggests that, that when Tatiana or Krista is uh, thirsty, but not the other one, um, the guards just goes to uh, you know, a water tank and then uh, uh, the one who was not thirsty just gets a uh, uh, glass and then give it to the other one, knowing that the other one is actually thirsty, but there was no linguistic communication between them going on. And they know that, you know, uh, they say that they know that the other one was thirsty. So this kind of thing seems to suggest that, that there is a feedback or, you know, what's generated inside of the consciousness goes down and then communicate the other one kind of thing. But we actually don't know what's going on inside of their brain and also um, the conscious phenomenology. So to summarize this part of the uh, lecture, uh, in terms of the boundary of consciousness, uh, phenomenological observation is that uh, our conscious experience has a um, definitive uh, boundary, usually, in most cases. Uh, I mean, uh, every case is as we know. And then um, IIT proposes that the boundary of consciousness uh, corresponds to the local maximum of integrated information. And uh, to find out what, why, what is the boundary, um, uh, at least we uh, um, can't uh, do it right now for the um, actual human brain, but in principle, if we try out all possible cuts and then identify the subset that maximize 
uh, maximizes the integrated information, then um, that is the one that is a boundary of constants. And then um, in terms of the clinical observation, uh, one conscious experience can split into two due to the split brain operations. Then IIT's proposal is to split, uh, is that the split brain operation split the complex uh, into two complex, what complex is. That's the why, a reason why we get the two consciousness. It's, and then the curious observation in the conjoined twins. So conjoined uh, joined the twins um, seem to share sensory experience, and we don't know exactly, um, uh, you know, uh, the, with a the very careful kind of experimentation. But you know, anecdotally, with this video or report from the patient and also you know our family, it seems to be the case. And one IIT's explanation is that um, the two complex, you know, inside uh, um, their conjoined you know, bodies can share the same inputs, uh, either uh, they are outside of either of the complex itself. It uh, notes that you know, one complex uh, cannot share the parts of the things together with the other one. So each of them has to have its own border, which is not including the other, but um, that's the sort of a theoretical prediction. Okay, so now, um, we come to uh, the final lecture next week. And uh, just to recap the remaining questions uh, that I posed you, uh, you know, throughout the lecture. So this is uh, the final question. How can IIT uh, in principle, and also even if it's correct, explain why different areas of the brain differentially contributes to different aspects of consciousness? What I mean is that the, the as you learned, faces experience or visual motions or color experience, these seems to be generated by the parts of the brain, such as, you know, our face or our from our face from face areas and visual motion uh, from our, you know, MT uh, areas and the colors from B8 or V4. And uh, what, what IIT says so far, uh, today's lecture is that, you know, these things, um, that, that these anatomical structures that can potentially generate these uh, percepts are in fact connected and also it is contained within this you know gigantic complex that generates our conscious experience and how exactly do that we don't know uh, uh, but in principle how these things that are generated by similarly you know uh, looking neurons are still in, uh, unclear and uh, in the final lecture i try to kind of give a sketch of exactly what kind of things can potentially generate different um, qualia. And that's the uh, next week, okay? And also, I also uh, will try to sketch how we can uh, test them. And this is the frontier of uh, consciousness research. All right, until then, see you.